Today on Martial Arts Radio, we're going to answer the question, or at least try to, mm. where have all the heroes gone? Mm. Right here. <laughs> no. <laughs> show over! If you're new to the show, head on over to whistlekick.com. Check out all the things that we do. If you want to go deeper on the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and bring you two episodes each and every week because we're looking to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. It's something that everyone who works at Whistlekick, Andrew, myself, the rest of the team, we're all really passionate about. And if it's something that you're passionate about, you might consider supporting our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You might consider picking something up at whistlekick.com in the store, maybe like this mug or something else. You can use the code podcast15 to save 15%. And if you want the entire list of all the things you can do to support us on our mission for the traditional martial artists worldwide, go to whistlekick.com slash family. Where have all the heroes gone, Andrew? That's a good question. We should probably elaborate a little more. We probably should. <laughs> All right. So you raised a good point. If you look back, specifically the 80s, mm -hmm. the 80s was like a golden era for martial arts culture. Because if you were someone who loved martial arts, if you were young, like you and I were, we had plenty of cartoons. We had Ninja Turtles. We had other things mm -hmm. that we could watch that were like, yes, I see some of myself in what these fictional characters are doing. Yep. If you were someone who loved competition, you had the heyday of kickboxing. You had Bill Wallace and Joe Lewis. You had Jeff Smith. And we weren't that far off from the 70s that we had. You know, we were just kind of fading out from Bruce Lee's era with mm -hmm. his films. And we also had coming in Steven Seagal and Jean-Claude Van Damme. And we had all of these things that martial arts culture-wise gave us plenty of places to look and say, okay, like I do this thing. Like I go a couple times a week and I train yep. and here are all these people that I can look up to. And now it's 2022 and the majority of the people that we look up to were there in the eighties. Yeah. We haven't had a lot of new people come up. Yeah. You know, I, I spent a, a fair bit of time thinking about this in the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and it came up in a recent interview episode that you had done, and I wish I had written it down, and I didn't. Um, but, you know, when we when we look back to the 80s, we, like, as you mentioned, there was all this stuff. There was, and, and even, like, even things that weren't martial arts-centric started to incorporate more martial art things. Mm -hmm. As an example, G.I. Joe, right? The G.I. Joe, yeah. like, was is not a martial art thing. But they started coming out with Storm Shadow and Jinx and Snake Eyes started being more martial arts centric. And yep. they just started incorporating all this stuff and it became huge and it pervaded into movies. Yep. And, you know, whenever we've done our How to Fight episodes, which if you haven't watched, you should go and watch. They're super fun. Um, we had no problem finding a plethora of movies to choose from so to cool. watch because there were so many of them. And so many of those actors were known and are still known as being martial arts actors. I mean, one of the biggest that I can think of is Jean-Claude Van Damme. If you go to any person today who's never done martial arts and you say, what is Jean-Claude Van Damme known for? They will inevitably say martial arts movies. Yeah. And you can't really do that today, I think, with actors in movies today. We not only has this come up on a recent episode, it came up very early on. One of the things that I identified quite early in my my stuff mission here with Whistlekick was that unless people have others to look at in an aspirational way, mm -hmm. it becomes really difficult to invest so much of yourself. How many children play a sport? that they can see a professional athlete that they identify with. Mm. You know, nobody alive today is going to be the next LeBron James mm. or Michael Jordan. Or there David might... Beckham. But there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people worldwide who look at those people and say, I want to be like them. So mm -hmm. Not I want to be them. I want to be like them. Sure. Right. Sure. Back in the 80s, be like Mike. Right? Like, yeah, that was, was that a Nike? I think that was a Nike campaign. Yeah. Yep. We 
on some level, very fundamental to our humanity, want to be more than we are. We mm -hmm. want growth, we want progress. This is something that is, is baked in the martial arts. Yep, yep. But we've lost those people because we don't have new ones coming in. Now, there are plenty that are trying. There are probably some who would say what, what we are doing, what I am doing, like fills a bit of that. Mm. But on my best day, I'm nowhere close to what yeah. any of these people were. And I'm never going to be there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One, because it's not my personality. Two, because I'm not doing those things. And three, because I think the world has changed. Or to borrow a Stephen King Turner phrase from the Dark Tower series, the world has moved on. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's true. And that's not to say that there aren't actors today that do martial arts. And it's also not to say that there aren't some martial arts movies coming out. But the actors that are doing martial arts aren't known for that. As an example, Jason Statham, right? Or the Born Identity series. Like, they, there's often people look at those movies and be like, oh, I really like the fight choreography in that. But those actors are not martial arts actors. They're actors who do some martial arts. And even the ones who are, even if we look at like Tony John, and Iko Uwai, yep, who are, as far as I'm concerned, objectively far better on screen mm -hmm. than their 80s counterparts. Yep, or Michael Jai White. It's another one. Michael Jai White is, is absolutely a, a wonderful martial artist, and I've had the chance to like train with him like that much. Like he's a great guy. Yep. His films are awesome, but it fails that that test mm -hmm. that can you go to just about anybody and say, who is Michael Jai White? Yeah. Exactly. Who is Tony Job? Who is Iko Uwais? Even the same people, even younger people today who have probably not seen very many, if any, Jean-Claude Van Damme movies or Steven Seagal movies mm -hmm. know who they are. Absolutely. And that, that, that is something that, that is the, the key here. I think it's that, that <laughs> cultural pervasiveness that we don't have. And I think there are a handful of things that are creating that situation. Movie budgets. Yeah. The average movie today, even adjusted for inflation, is so much more expensive than it was back then. You know, we can take it, and, and we joke about best of the best and everything. If you look at the budget on best of the best, it was a few million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. It was because we didn't have huge TVs in our house mm -hmm. and hundreds of channels. If you wanted to see some martial arts stuff, you would go to the movies, mm -hmm. right? It was such, it was a bigger part of our culture to go out to the theater. Yeah. And remember now we're at a point where the video game industry is bigger than the movie industry. A yeah. lot of people probably don't realize that. It, it genuinely is bigger. There's more money spent on video games in the world. I don't, I can't, I don't know if I can say the world. Definitely in the US. US. I think it's a global thing than film. So if, if they're going to put this money in, there has to be a good chance of a return. How do wealthy people remain wealthy? They don't blow their money on things that probably aren't going to work. Or yeah. if they are going to work, have a significant return. Mm -hmm. Right? This is why uh, the Marvel movies like own the box office because they throw a ton of money in and there's just such a cultural phenomenon there that we all feel compelled to go watch those films. We could take random no-name actor off the street and make an amazing martial arts film and nobody's going to go see it. Mm. And it's still going to cost $30 million split together. Yeah. I think... I also think something that has led to the the decline of those types of movies is, believe it or not, the internet. Because in the 80s, if you wanted to see martial arts stuff, you had to go to the movies. Yeah. Or TV. I mean, there were some there were some things on TV, but and we all subscribed to Black Belt magazine. Yeah, right? exactly, we, exactly. We had so few options. Yes. Yeah. And now it's so much easier to be able to go online and see martial arts stuff yeah. that the I I think, and this is only speculation, but the movie producing people have said, you know what, the we could make a movie about this. We could make a martial arts action movie, but the people that want to see it is a smaller subset, and they're just going to go online and watch whatever they want anyway. Yeah. It's not going to be as fruitful for us financially. Whereas back then, there were so few things for us to go to. And what's interesting now is we look at that let's call it the fracturing of, yeah. of entertainment, mm -hmm. not just attention, but dollars. 
and it means that we have these options that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Pre-internet, this couldn't have existed. You and I could have sat down, we could have talked. Yeah. We could have recorded it. It would have even a basic camera would have cost way more than all the gear in this room, you know, it would have been a yeah. few grand. Yeah. And then we could have duplicated the tapes, we could have taken ads out in magazines, people could have Order the new copy. Nobody's going to do that, yeah. right? Like to hear a couple guys talking. But it's easy and it's free for the listeners and the yep. viewers, which means some people are willing to do it. So we, as we, we have the same amount of collective attention. It's just been broken up and spread around. Yeah. And I think that fracturing is splintering out of stuff has hurt more than just martial arts movies. How many remakes are getting done? Because people can't come up with new stuff, right? Well, they can, but it's risky. Exactly. Well, exactly, exactly. So they're going to stick with something that that worked before. And so there are so many movies that either did get remade or are getting remade. Um, I even heard there's going to be a reboot of Best of the Best. Really? Yeah, I really did. <laughs> it can't get worse. But what's the budget going to be, right? It's going to yeah, be 10, 20, 30 million dollars, right? Like you can't make these inexpensive movies because they won't they won't work. And when we look at who our heroes are, and, and, and I, you know, I'm using that term loosely, you know, people that we can look at and say, this person's doing some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be more like them. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we get folks like Michael John White, mm -hmm. Jesse Ancom. We get uh, Ian Abernethy. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of people who are doing some really cool stuff. We've had a lot of those people on this show and they do great things. But are they and are they ever going to reach the level of being so well known, so pervasive, even in our realm? Yeah, that everyone knows who they are. Yeah, I could go to. I'm going to guess the average Taekwondo practitioner. Mm -hmm. They're not going to know who Jesse or Ian are. Yep, that's likely true. And honestly, even younger martial artists. And when I say younger, I'm not talking six. I'm talking you know high school age. Yep even, you know, within the traditional karate world, they might not know who those two people are. I find it interesting. Uh, the, the, so many of you know that I have the opportunity to train with Bill Wallace and, and you know, spend some time with him or earn rank with him and have attended quite a few seminars that other people have paid to host him to come in. Yeah. You know who Bill Wallace is. You've mm -hmm. known who Bill Wallace is for decades. Since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I did not know who he was when I was a kid because we didn't pay attention to very many things. You know, my, my, I mean, you can't see out the, the window, but I grew up in the woods very much like I live <laughs> in the woods now. Like I was literally and figuratively in the woods. But as I came to learn who he was, as I, I got a little bit older, I was like, oh, okay. And all these other contemporaries, right? If you were to survey people today who are the biggest martial arts figures, they're all folks from back then. Mm. Right. It's Chuck Norris. Yeah. It's Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee is still the biggest figure in martial arts and he's been gone for 50 years. Yeah. That I think is indicative of, I'm not going to say it's a problem, but I'm going to say that unless we can correct that, those of us who look at the martial arts and say, I want more people to participate, we lose that. Mm. What percentage of youth have spent time playing pickup basketball or shooting around or jumped into a rec program or played for their school. Mm. It's a much higher percentage yeah. than martial arts. I mean, I can think back to how many people in my school, in my high school, back in the 90s when, I mean, it's, it's hard to play the trends and know exactly where yeah, things sure, were, sure. but there were a handful of us, and yet there, were a bar, there was a varsity and a junior varsity boys and girls basketball team, right? Mm -hmm. just, just those numbers alone there were way more people, Yeah, right? We played basketball in gym. We didn't do martial arts in gym. Now, there are some gyms that bring in someone, you mm -hmm. know, sure. Craig Wareham's hinted at that. We know that he does that in his area. I'm sure there are plenty of others who do that around the world. Yeah, I mean, Andy Allen does it. We had him right, on a while right, right. And he does a great high school program. Um, but it, you're right, it's not something that's that's as well known. And, and you know, kind of going back a little bit to these, you know, the younger generation that doesn't know that, this the other generation you know this episode will come out you know long after we've had a lot of people on the show bill wallace you know frank duke cynthia rothrock and you know i will often uh when when an episode comes out I'm like oh my gosh it's so great we just released an episode with so and so and i'll mention it to people in my school and they'll and you know 
20 plus year olds would be like, who, who, who's Bill Wallace? Who, you know, who's Cynthia Rothrock? I'm like, and back yeah. then that wouldn't have been the case. Right. And, and you could make the argument, uh, know your history. Like mm -hmm. we have people on the show who, who say that, like, you should know who, your history. You should know where you come from. But if they don't know who those people are and there really isn't anyone today, it creates a vacuum. Yep. And nature abhors a vacuum. Nature does not like a vacuum. It gets filled with other things. And my fear, this is this is why I think this is an important thing to talk about, is if that vacuum exists too long, it means it gets filled with things that are not martial arts. Yeah. We have had plenty of people identify uh, the John Wick films as some of their favorite martial arts films. No one's calling Keanu Reeves a martial artist. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Um, is he an actor that does martial arts? Sure. Yeah. Does he do a, a good job? Absolutely. Yeah, but he is not what I would consider a martial arts actor. He's not known for being a martial artist. Right. He was an actor who later learned martial arts with some competency. I'm not taking anything away from him. Sure. But when we look at the current crop today, who is the biggest martial arts actor? It's Donnie Yen. Yeah, probably. Donnie Yen is the biggest one. Uh, Daniel Wu fills some of that space. Michael Jai White. Yeah. No, the, the broad population doesn't know who they are. So one of the things that I've always, not always, one of the things since the beginning of Whistle Kick that I've identified is how do we get those people there? Well, if you look at the past crop of heroes, what do they all have in common? Mm, they were all charismatic. Mm -hmm. They were all martial artists first. Mm -hmm. There's one know. important thing. They all had competitive success. Oh, yeah, you know. It's easy to forget. Yeah. Chuck Norris was a competitor. Bill yeah. Wallace was a competitor. Cynthia Rothrock was yep. a competitor. Absolutely. Right? We've got the the majority of these folks, yep. vast majority, were validated in the competitive world and brought forward. Yeah. But then you have the argument against that, like Bruce Lee. He was not, he doesn't have any competitive. There, there are, there are exceptions. Absolutely. Yeah. But Bruce Lee's not here, right? Yeah. That's right. So I, I believe that one of the ways that we move this forward is resolving the competitive is, issue. Yeah. yeah. You know, and we've talked about that on the show a number of times. And, and I think until we solve that, which takes money, and one of the long-term goals of Whistlekick is to have the, the influence and the finances to put on some larger tournaments, both in terms of attendance as well as uh, incentive. Yep, yep. And I think that that can carry things forward. You know, there, there are some absolutely phenomenal martial arts competitors out there. Yeah. But we're not going to see them on TV. And thus, we're not building that aspirational. Yeah. And uh, listeners could help support that. <laughs> My HP warranty expires on 5-15-2022. For those watching uh, on oh YouTube, you can God. see the pop-up. Andrew, talk while I fix yeah. it, please. Um, you know, for those listeners that want to help support that endeavor, they could join our Patreon, right? That's a, a clear, delineated way. You help support us. We can help promote that sort of engagement. Yeah. It's... You know, we're, we're not getting there just, just from Patreon, but this is, it, it's all the different things that we're putting together. And, and I want, I think I just want people to realize that when, when we identify a thing, that our world, mm -hmm. you know, it could be the big world or it could be the martial arts world, needs, we have a plan. We don't always share the plan because sometimes the plan can't be public. Yeah. But we have a plan. We, we don't just come to you with, this sucks, this is a problem which um, I'm sorry, most of the world just brings you problems. We try yeah. to bring you, here's a plan that we have to solve it. Yeah. yeah. Are we going to get there? I hope so. I'm going to work as we're hard as try. I can to get there. I know we're all working hard to move things forward. But just recognize that problems require solutions. And yeah, we're just adding a bit of that there. What do you think? Who are your heroes? How many of them are let's say new how many of them are historical mm. how many of them started their career after you i think that's an important test there have been i don't know that there is there are very few people 
who are celebrated today who started training after I did. Mm. Yep. That's interesting. And that that's an odd thing to think of. Yeah, that's right? a good point. Now, one of the pieces that we miss, because you know, we're both in our 40s, what was it like for those people that we've identified? Did they feel the same back then? Right? You know, we, we've had Bill Wallace on the show and, and he um, and, and it's not it's it's not fake. He he's a humble guy. Right. Yeah. I've heard that from many, not just you, yeah. but from many people. And I did a recent episode with someone who spoke of like that past generation, Moses Powell and Peter Urban and uh, figures that were, you know, 10 to 15 years ahead of a lot of the people that we're talking about now. They weren't movie stars, but they were celebrated because it was a much tighter circle. Yeah. Yeah. Back then. And I just, I, I, I hope we can do something about this because I want everyone to be able to put on their whatever they train in yeah, yeah. and, you know, have their be like Mike moment. Because mm. I think that that's an important aspect of your growth as a martial artist to feel bigger than you are, at least for a few minutes. Yeah, I concur. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We appreciate all of you. If you want to support us, remember, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Grab something at whistlekick.com with the code podcast15. If you want the whole list, things like books and training programs and all the things that we do, whistlekick.com slash family, you're going to get the whole list. We update that once a week. We update a lot of things at least once a week, like the Patreon. Yeah. There's a lot of value there. If you want to go deeper on the show, we do transcripts and links and all kinds of cool stuff. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Our social media is at Whistlekick. If you want to get a hold of us, I'm Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. Andrew at Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Our social media, did I sorry say that? At Whistlekick. Yeah, I feel like I said that. You did. We've got a newsletter. I don't have notes. I'm trying to go off notes as we move forward with this. And just thank you. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Until then, train hard, smile, and have a great day. day.